Okay. All right, cool. Okay, welcome everybody to my talk. Um, you have entered the brave new world of Gen AI with vector search. So as such, this is a topic that's kind of got so much attention these days. I'm sure everybody knows about it, but what it is, I think everybody has a different way of understanding generative AI. And uh, so I'm going to actually spend a bit of time giving introduction, and as such, this is more of an introductory talk. So I hope um, it's okay with you. Uh, if I'm repeating something that you already know too much, feel free to leave, I won't be offended. Because as such, it's for folks like yourselves, I'm sure you're experienced folks here, but maybe you just haven't worked with AI yet or something. So yeah, so uh, as such, you know, I'm gonna start, and uh, my name is Mary Wigleski. I'm the AI practice lead at the consulting firm called Caliberty that's based in Ohio, Cincinnati specifically. But I'm, I actually live in Chicago, and I actually lived in Boston too um, 20 years ago. So yeah, I'm kind of really happy to be back in Boston. I haven't been back, so it's really nice. So really nice to be back, so that's me. Okay, so this is the uh, agenda for today. Um, and again, you know, a bit of introduction, and then um, get into like some of the terminologies that we all are hearing about. Um, and retrieval augment, on augmented generation vector database. I'll actually be touching a little bit too on agents and, multi, and workflows and multi-agentic. I won't be able to get into very deeply because it's just gonna be a 30 minute talk, but just at least give you some idea. And then the challenges too. Uh, normally too with this talk I would do for 15 minutes and I would include a small demo, but today being so short, I won't have time to do the demo, but I'll give you um, my contact information, plus I also do Twitch. Uh, when I have time, I kind of go back to doing live streaming and all that, so you can also join me there too. Okay, so first let me quickly introduce myself, who's Mary. Um, I already told you I'm in the, at the small consulting firm, but actually the previous six years, I just joined my consulting firm about two months ago. Previously, I was a developer advocate for six years. Um, I was at IBM for four years as a Java developer advocate, and then two years at Datastax. This company that they actually are a commercial uh, company for Apache Cassandra. But I work on Apache Pulsar, which is an event streaming um, library, much like Kafka. So that was, that's my uh, background, and then I was also a developer for over 20 years too, primarily in Java. I started working with Java in 2000, so I'm also a Java champion. I run the Chicago Java Users Group as well as I'm the Chicago chapter co-lead for the AI Camp meetup group, so just, just so you know. So that's uh, quickly about me. Okay, and uh, so I'll, I'm gonna start. This is just a brief intro and background of generative AI. Um, but first of all, let's try to understand. Let's everybody try to understand because even yesterday I was at the Day Zero uh, AI think tank uh, event, pre-event here, and, and somebody was saying that let's try to define artificial intelligence, what it is, and kind of make sure we are on the same page. So anyway, so in my case I decided, well, let's put in a picture of the history too, prior to the current state of AI that we are in. I'm finding it interesting, and I actually, I, I didn't design it, but I found it on the web, and it's, there's also a link too. And I'll be sharing this slide deck with you, so in case you want the information, don't worry about missing it, because I'll actually be sharing with you. Um, so I got it, this particular slide from this link, and it describes the past about 100 years of development in the 20th century of how the current, you know, kind of AI has kind of begun. So in the 1930s, that's when the golden age of science fiction started. And then, you know, roughly like 10 years or so in, you know, after that was like 1950, that's when the, the father of modern computing, Alan Turing, um, started you know, asking about, he wrote a paper, right, about can machines think? So since then, too, there have been a lot of um, many um, different research institutions and everything, and, but these are just highlighting some of them, and among which is actually in 1997, IBM had a deep blue, um, if you're familiar with the chess player, um, uh, the chess, uh, it's actually an older traditional uh, artificial intelligence um, robot called Deep Blue that's only dedicated and is by supervised training that trains the, the bot to play chess and beat Gary Kasparov at that time in 1997. So I found it interesting because I worked at IBM before. So, okay, so the, uh, this is kind of a bit of history that's kind of building up to where we are. But if you think about AI, all it's about is that we actually want some machines to do 
more work for us. It's sort of at the heart of it is about automation that we're striving for. So let's also understand it to AI, machine learning, and deep learning, how they are related. This is kind of a very simplified, but also explains, you know, in using th set theory to explain the relationships of AI, ML, and deep learning, which is, you know, artificial intelligence kind of encompasses everything. It mimics the intelligence of human beings and behavior patterns that human beings have or other living entities. Um, but as you kind of get deeper into it, then there's the, you know, the, the uh, machine learning uh, kind of uh, subset of it. And it's basically is a technique by which, you know, the machines will learn on its own and from the data that you provide it. So is the, the training uh, based on, you know, uh, like techniques such as supervised and supervised training and reinforcement learning. But just relying on pure like machine learning techniques is not enough. We really have to get into the deep learning which is neural network, and that actually mimics how the human brains work, you know, based on neural networks. So that's the deep learning, and that's where all of the LLMs, the current gen AI LLMs, all of these are the magic is happening in that kind of layer, the deep learning side. Okay, so let's take a look, fascinating look at this generative AI era. So I kind of jump ahead. So gen AI too, as such, you know, came out only in, less than two years ago in November of 2022, and it came out because of ChatGPT that wow, everybody, is a disruptive field in, in um, AI, in artificial intelligence. It has the potential to change the way we create and consume content. Now, if you think about it, you might say, well, we already have some AI uh, before that, before Gen AI. Yes, and that was uh, more predictive AI. Like, if you kind of look at it, predictive AI, what it does is usually it has a time limit to it, right? And you may be doing business forecasts for a year or two, and then uh, weather forecast, you can use predictive AI. It crunched through a lot of data, plus also apply a lot of statistical kind of analysis and models to it. Um, but whereas like for generative AI is kind of disruptive because now basically you are no longer restrictive, restricted to like communicating with your bot in a, in a computer way. Meaning that now you can actually talk to your bots like you talk to another person. And that's natural language. Um, kind of, you can talk just like you talk to another person. And that's very uh, kind of groundbreaking too. But of course it's not like all new because already Siri already came out like 10 years ago or so and using NLP as well. But anyway, that's generative AI because it's fascinating because now we can write um, an essay and it can, you know, design a dress and write a piece of music and write code and all of these things that are wowing us. And uh, basically it generates contents and that's why it's generative because it generates contents as opposed to their pure transformer like BERT, for example, and uh, like a precursor to the LLMs, uh, BERT, and that's more of a transformer, but generative AI, generative model will also does do the generation uh, of, of, the, uh, of the response to, um, so that's that. And so just real, real quickly to um, point out some of the, um, the history too. And I, as such, I point out already there's 2011, Apple brings AI and natural language processing assistant to the masses by releasing its first Siri, uh, iPhone with Siri. Um, but then before that, actually it started in 2003, sort of like really the precursor to the current uh, Gen AI was this feed forward neural network language model. And that's so roughly about 20 years ago. So then kind of you kind of look into it too. Um, I'd like to highlight to 2013, there's a group of Google researchers that actually created this word to VEC. And that's um, important because that forms the basis of a vector database too. And essentially is relying or kind of being derived, you know, the, the algorithms of the research is originated from word to VEC, this uh, technique too. Um, and then 2017, you might have heard of this paper with a kind of a famous tagline that says, attention is all you need. So that was the paper that came out of here is the transformer uh, led by Google uh, research team and they have a simple network architecture. So that's kind of precursor to all of the generative AI uh, kind of movement. Um, if you look into generative AI, I, you know, you, it, what makes it possible is really the models too behind it, right? And so generative models, these are like a handful of the ones that are kind of the popular ones. And among, among it all, OpenAI is kind of the de facto kind of organization. 
that has came out of GPT, came out of it was GPT 3.5 first, and then GPT 4, and now also GPT 4.0 as well. And then there's also, for example, stable diffusion is the first image to text, uh, text to image uh, model. So that's stable diffusion, and from there it led to Dolly Mid Journey. And then there's also Codex, which is the forms the the model behind GitHub Copilot. Um, and then there's also Cohere, you might have heard of as well. Cohere is also a popular model. Mistral, and this kind of open source model, uh, has the 7B that seems to be quite popular. Um, and then there's also BERT, I mentioned. BERT is from Google, but it's precursor to all of the LLMs, and it's primarily a transformer type of architecture, too. Um, okay, and then there's Llama, Llama 2, the Llama family from Meta, Llama 2, Llama 3. And then Whisper is an audio one, and then uh, Anthropic and came, came out from there with Claude. And I find Claude a little bit you know, better in terms of writing, and that's what I found. So, Okay, so those are just a small handful. And let's take a look, too, then there are generative apps that are like leveraging on all of the models, and so among which is basically the most famous, ChatGPT, and then there are also Git, you know, GitHub Copilot, Gemini itself too came out from Google. Um, it's kind of like the new version and replace, has replaced BART. Um, then SEO AI, Salesforce, all of these other ones that you see. But these are again tiny little example of some of the generative apps. Okay, so another aspect of this generative AI technology is, is the modality. So as you can see, like we, we you know, when it first came out it was just purely text to text. But, it, but then like over just a short few months, we already are seeing text to image, image to text and from stable diffusion. And, and then also like text to code and code to image, and oops, sorry, and uh, all of these things. And then essentially these are the different modes that, um, you know, for a while too, it was like the, the main thing that all of the research uh, was being done. But now I think it's kind of reached a point of being quite advanced and just as, for example, like OpenAI, has Sora, the, the model that's actually video to text and text to video, that's actually quite advanced too. And as we can see that every day we're hearing new things. So that's the amazing thing about this field. It just never stays at one place. It keeps kind of evolving very quickly. Okay, so now then let's kind of step things up, stepping things up, right? All the Gen AI, chat GPT is it's kind of a lot of hype too. But if you kind of think about deeply, Basically, LLM has a lot of limitations too, despite the fact that it seems like being so capable. You ask question and it answers. But notice that what we're asking usually is zero shot, right? It's basically you don't give it any more you know, a prompt other than just one prompt, asking it to answer your question. I guess unless you write code in LangChain or some other kind of library that you can help to kind of chain together and, and form kind of a context in your processing. Otherwise, it's one shot kind of usages or like one shot or zero shot. Zero sh shot is basically just a prompt without anything. And then one shot is usually you give it a little bit more hint to the LLM to try to answer your question. Anyway, so. As such, you know, LLM, there's no memory in it, um, and results are very probabilistic. And so as you can see, it's like fussy logic. You can ask some LLMs multiple times the same questions, but it comes back with different answers. And also, too, it's opaque because you cannot add attributions to the answers, too. And also, not only that, basically LLMs are very expensive, we know, and it's kind of, you know, takes a lot of time, takes a lot of GPU to kind of do things, and also, um, Yesterday, too, at the pre-event, uh, the lady Heidi, and she was one of the panelists, and she talked about how if you try to ask a question of ChatGPT, it actually consumes like, you know, uh, something like it produced, I forgot exactly, but something like quite expensive, too, in, 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 if you're using it. So it's not very sustainable, it's not very green energy conscious. So it's, we know it, is, it can do a lot of things, but also costs a lot of money. Um, and so basically, to make LLMs to be truly workable, you basically have to also consider, for example, if you're, you want to actually make your, you know, write your applications using you know, Gen AI technology or just AI technology, you have to think about scalability too. And also, not only that, right? we live in a complex world, so all the things too, it's not just one step or very distinct black and white steps. There are many workflows that interact with one another, many subsystems. So we need to consider complex tasks. So just by itself, it's just not able to, to answer it right now. 
um, to, to kind of do that thing. But that's why too later I'll quickly talk about multi-agentic collaboration. It's a newer kind of uh, research into it. It's only been like a year or so. So it's, it's, it's being developed right now, that approach using agents. So that can help with developing complex workflows. Okay, so then also with memory and also remembering the state. So these are just some of the things we have to remember that LLMs need all of these capability to do some real work for us. Okay, so now um, just this is just kind of quickly show you too the large language models and how you know the GPT is actually lowering the barrier to AI, like you know how it departs from traditional AI. We're still doing two phases, right? There is training phase to train all your models, and then when it's ready, then you do inferencing. Basically, it's applying your techniques to search for your answers, right, with the trained model. So as you can see, and and that's what like this you know, new, new kind of revolution of LLMs are able to do, kind of lowering the barrier for, for us to use AI. Okay, so now also let's understand the players too in the Gen AI era that we're talking about. But first of all, you know, it's the GPT, which stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer. So what it does is that as such, the name is Transformer, that means it transforms. It takes simple prompts in human language um, kind of natural human language format. There's no longer a need for you to write code like you know, trying to, let's say a, a Java program, you need to say some parameter and then you give it all these things in a long string. You can just talk to your, your bot as though you're talking to another person. That's your input to your, you know, your, your machine instruction. So that's revolutionary. And then basically too, the transformer will do pattern matching. Essentially, these are called similarity searches too that search for all the answers for you in there. And it answers questions for the prompts. And so we already know what this capab capability is, like right? writing essays, blog posts, blah, 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 all these fancy things. So now GPT um, basically started showing up at around like 2018. It's basically the first paper came out was only barely like five, six years ago, right? Uh, from uh, OpenAI, the generative pre-training uh, GPT of that language model. Very soon then OpenAI um, upgraded it to GPT-2 that has incorporated more data to it too. Um, and then very soon, you know, in 2022, Stability AI developed Stable Diffusion, that's the text to, model, uh, text to image model, all of these things. And then it also then ev eventually culminated in 2022, ChatGPT 3.5. And that kind of reached 1 million users within five days. So that's, since then, it's been kind of still holding us, you know, mesmerized with this technology, but I do believe the hype has died down a little bit. Everybody is looking at it to see what this thing can actually do for us. Okay, so now the next thing is about natural language processing. Let's just take a quick look at it. And basically, it, it's an interdisciplinary subfield of linguistics of computer science. So the concern is to process natural language data sets, right, from large corpora of data, um, like text or speech corpora. And it uses rule-based or probabilistic machine learning approaches to do it, and it enables computer to learn from the contents and including contextual um, insights and nu nuances of the language itself too. And so it basically, this language and uh, natural language processing allows you to draw more insights than just giving you answers like what it used to be, right? Okay, so now it gets to LLMs, large language models, and that's what like developers, I, I believe most of you are developers here or one way or the other, working with di directly, you know, with, with technology, with, you know, all the, all the hands-on practitioner. So this is what we work with, is a type of machine learning or deep learning model. And as such, you know, I already mentioned it, it's just very expensive to produce. It's amazing, but it's also kind of limiting too in some sense. And basically too, these are foundation type of models that's trained on a broad range of data. And so say for example, if you're an insurance company and you have specific data or a hos hospital, and those actually won't be in there, right? So I, I'll be talking another technique that you can leverage on to kind of fill in the gaps that LLMs doesn't have shortly. So. So basically, too, the pre-training, right? Uh, oh, oh, actually, I was going to say, and how can we tell, right? These are LLMs. It's basically what it does is, is language processing and then utilizing NLP and also has visual comprehension of the computer vision, too, in there. And then also it does co-generation. And also one interesting thing is the human-centered engagement, too. So then it can answer prompts just like a human. 
analyze the sentiments and dealing with chatbot-like conversations, the interactions too. Okay. Now then, what is an LLM? So now if we take the original uh, diagram of AI, ML, and, and deep learning, and that's where LLM sits. It's basically over here inside the deep learning side. And essentially, too, that's where Gen AI is in that layer of deep learning, where LLMs it, it sits is the transformer and also image generation with these um, kind of specific like transformers for image generation. And it leverages data sciences and natural language processing to do its job. Okay, so now you may be asking, well, how can I work with LLMs, right? As developers, basically there are um, you know, libraries that you can work with. I, I think among all of the ones, some of you I'm sure already are working with, the libraries such as Langchain is very popular, Python library, uh, Llama Index too, and also Semantic Kernel from Microsoft. Um, it's all open source. And Google has Gemini API that works with what used to be, uh, or actually still Vertex AI, that platform. And then there's also Hugging Face, which is like the repository for all of the AI resources, as we all know. Just think of it like GitHub for all your source code. This is Hugging Face, it's for all of your AI resource sharing, like a platform for sharing things, um, and uh, data sets as well. Okay, and then because I'm a Java person, so I kind of like to share too that if you're a Java person, You'll find it useful to also know about uh, Langchain 4J, even though Java is lagging behind from like, you know, when compared with Python, um, but Java is slowly catching up. I think Java has a lot of potential being such a um, proven, like, you know, kind of a strong language, right, that supports concurrency, for example, very heavy duty server side work. So there's also Langchain 4J that you can work with to essentially use it to interact with your LLMs and also like dealing with vector database embedding models, all of these things. And there's also semantic kernel also has a Java SDK. And then Spring AI also has, uh, is the newest project from Spring uh, that works with AI. It's a bit new at this point. And then also these two I wanted to point out is actually from my previous company, DataStacks. Um, they developed this JLama is a Java port of the Llama uh, library. Um, and then also JVector is a lower level library that helps with vector database uh, uh, vector API Project Panama type of uh, processing, very fast too, this one. And then there's also a Llama 2, which is a direct port from Llama C. Okay, so if you're kind of wondering, right, there's with Java code, you can write uh, Langchain 4J, a very hello world one that doesn't do anything except it will just do a chat model and you want to associate with an open API key. And with that setup, then you can generate the result. In this particular case, it's hello world. So it doesn't actually do anything other, other than generating the result in this case. So yeah, so this is how you do it. But again, very kind of basic uh, example. Okay, so what about like in players? Then there are also people players too. Now we look at the data, there are data scientists. They are the subject matter expert and computer vision engineers. They are subject you know, matter expert, but like most of us maybe are developers, we are really the AI engineer or the ML ops engineer and data en uh, engineer that we actually help the data scientists and computer vision engineer to implement their, what they see to or foresee in, in you know, what it's supposed to be doing. So, so any, anyway, my point of putting up this slide is that because there was a, also a lot of talks about you know, AI is going to take away our jobs and I really don't think so because there, it just means there will be new things, new jobs um, kind of being uncovered, I think as we're seeing this uh, evolu uh, evolution of this uh, new, new technology. So it's like, if you think about industrial revolution, I think back in the 20th century when they were afraid, you know, like of, of I industrial revolution taking away farm jobs, yes, of course, but then there are new jobs being developed. So that's what I kind of believe in, there will be new things. I mean, already we know like auditing, for, for example, you can't trust LLMs too well, you, you need actually people to audit to make sure things are done right, right? The quality control, that's already one new kind of work. Prompt engineering, for example, that's also all new. So that's just examples of such. Okay, so now let me really quickly then step through a couple of things that right? I want to talk about, RAG and retrieval augmented generation. This one, I think it's actually quite simple in concept. Uh, it's basically this model Essentially, too, it, it's consisted of two components. One is the retrieval model, is the other is the generative model. So the idea is that you want to produce text that's not only contextually accurate, but also like information rich, too. Um, and what, by that, what it means, right? 
So basically, as such, right, LLMs are limited because you are, let's say you are ChatGPT 3.5, it only processed data up to 2021, the end of 2021. So what happened now between then, if you're using 3.5 and you need the data that comes after that, and not only that too, in cases in which you, you have private data like a, a lawyer, a legal firm or something, you need some private data. So you can use this RAG kind of a technique and model. It's an architectural model. You can implement it any way you want, but it's basically, you can use this model to help you to kind of fill in those gaps and also do, so, so to speak, like real-time data. So using RAG, you can um, basically, the retrieval model is, is, think of it like a librarian. It pulls in all of the relevant data um, and it can be pulled from database or from like you know, corpus of documents and unstructured data. For example, they are really good with that PDF files and all of these things. You can kind of pull them and feed it into the LLM and answer questions for you. And, and then basically the librarian is pulling in all the data, then it gets, it, and it will feed the data to the generative model side. So basically once the, you get answers from LLM, the generative model will then beautify the information. It will fill in more information make it more enriching, and that's the idea. So they work kind of in tandem to kind of provide, you know, answers uh, that are very accurate, but also, you know, very contextually rich too. So that, that was, that's a retrieval, and then for generative side, and you can think of it like that's the model that's responsible for writing uh, things, right? It's the writer, it's like creative writer, and it uh, synthesizes all of the retrieved information into very, you know, te contextually very rich kind of uh, information for you. And that's what it's usually wowing us if we ask him a question and he comes back with answers that is filled with a lot of information. So, and so essentially that's, that's the REC framework. But since I don't have as much time, so let me kind of go to the next thing, which is vector database and similarity search. So really quickly, what is vector database? It's a purpose-built database that serves up like vector data type. And why do we need it? Because generative AI kind of usages, we're dealing with data that needs to be multidimensional, right? As such, um, you know, if we kind of think of traditional data, traditional database, they handle data in scalar format. But then in order to be able to handle these complex data, essentially we have to think of data having multi-dimensions, and in order to do that, we leverage on linear algebra, if you're a math person. Um, actually, I was kind of happy when I started working on generative AI, because I never get to work with my math that I study in college. For many years, I was fixing a lot of problems in bad code, and so finally, okay, work with generative AI, I pull out my linear algebra book, and then you kind of, kind of really review all of the matrix calculations actually make sense now. So essentially, too, what it does is that with vector data, is basically, um, it's, it will convert, let's say you have some strings of data coming in, you need to store them into your database. It will convert them into numerical representations. And if you kind of select columns of data that's vector data type, it will give back like arrays of floating point numbers. So like if you just look at it, it's probably very hard to understand. But that's the thing, the beauty of it is that you have algorithms that you can process and do all the similarity searches leveraging on like linear algebra kind of techniques uh, to, to do all of the work. So then that gets stored into your vector database and make sure too, when you convert them, you do need to use some embedding models and their open AI has their embedding models too and there are other embedding models. I think there are like roughly 17 or 20 or so like vector embeddings models out, out there you can use. But make sure you use the same model for storing and then use it for querying too, otherwise it won't work. And basically too, it uses um, a technique called approximate nearest neighbor to do all of these um, kind of calculations. So just really quickly to kind of explain the mechanism a little bit, uh, if you're a math person, and if we take a very simple example of a two dimensional vectors, so you can kind of look at the data itself, no longer store as just like, you know, like a, a cell or something, but they are being stored in this dimensional pane. And then essentially, let's say you have a query is V1, in there, and then there are already data stores as v t v two and v three on there. then basically, if you come in and looking for an answer, the closest one v two will get re get returned to you so that's kind of a layman's quick explanation of how it works so this is an example a more realistic example so it's like you know you have cat and dog and house, so the cat is what you're it's called a query a vector 
coming in, you're looking for something closest to it, it will be a dog that gets returned because dog is in the same category of it. So it will naturally be a little bit closer. So that's what, that's what it is. So, um, and, and that's essentially how it works. But of course, in reality, your data is many dimensions too, as you know. OpenAI, for example, is 1,600 for their 3.5, I think the chat GPT. So there are you know, many dimensions. So what it does is that you know, in the vector search, it actually has different layers too that it is doing all of the mathematical calculations in there to derive at the answers that you need. And it's super fast too, normally with this uh, vector database. So if you are interested to work with vector database, these are some of the open source options like Milvis, PG Vector is an extension of Postgres, uh, Chroma, it's also open source and Fast from Meta, and Quadrant and also Weaviate. These are just a small handful of all of these open source database that I find to be kind of quite popular too. But I also want to point out PG Vector seems to be quite easy to use. If you're a Postgres user, PG Vector will be a good, good thing to use. It doesn't use exactly approximate nearest neighbor. I think there's a slightly different kind of, I forgot exactly the name, but it uses slightly different techniques to do the, the matching stuff. So, so, okay, so vector embeddings, it's not only is it being used for search, it's used for clustering and all of these other anomaly detection, diversity measurement, so um, like, like that. So, okay, so now I, I will skip this because we only have five more minutes, but this is just a diagram explaining how vector da data is being you know, used, how vector database can be used in a normal kind of generative AI apps, RAG application. So. Okay, so one more thing I want to share is about agents and workflows. So as such, right, I mentioned about LLMs are being very limiting. So if we want to do something that's more complex, more like real world, we need to have an airline reservation system and all of these, it has a lot of data, data needs to flow through many subsystems. So basically too, we can think of um, implementing this using software entities that's called agents. So within the software context, right? So these agents will deal with like orchestrating like complex workflows and in kind of any kind of data flow kind of system. And because there's tons of data flowing through like in an AI type of situation, right? There are pipelines of data. So what it does, it also coordinates the activities of multiple agents and process all the logic and evaluate answers. But I also want to point out too, this one is interesting, is about the agentic design patterns. There are essentially four patterns too. One is uh, reflection. Is reflection is essentially your you are kind of having agents that will take care of your, let's say you're prompting the LLM for some, uh, ask him some question and it comes back with some answer and you don't, you don't want to take the answers to, uh, with the first pass. So essentially you take what you get and you feed it back to the LLM and ask it again. This kind of reflection. Ask it to refine the answers for you so then you make sure your final answer is accurate. So that's reflection. And then you can also like have tool use. It's basically, you are kind of giving the LLM some prompt and saying that if you can't find the answers, um, go look up, let's say Wikipedia, go look up at another website, things like that. So it's essentially you're giving more help to the LLMs to help you to answer, to get the answers that you want. So that's tool use. And then there's also planning, which is like you're asking the LLMs to actually start to plan out all of the steps. So that's a bit kind of like less of, um, like deterministic kind of uh, answers you can get. So you're asking the LLMs to become a little bit wiser to kind of figure out the steps to figure out in order to kind of derive the answers that you need. And then there's also multi-agent collaboration. So that with, you know, kind of with the name, it's basically you, any situation you have each agent's doing specific tasks, so they all need to be collaborating together in order to give you the answers that you need. Um, that's multi-agent collaboration. Think of like an orchestra, right, that's playing music. The music needs to come out correct, you know, you can't have all of the different instruments playing like this in discordant kind of uh, fashion. So it's kind of the same idea. Okay, so it's a couple of uh, multi-agentic libraries that you can think of using. These are all Python, by the way, Autogen, Crew AI, LangGraph, and AutoGPT if you're interested, and there are many more out there too. Okay, so now then the last piece, I think the last minute is challenges of this. So as much as LLMs, ChatGPT things, uh, like so kind of wowing, um, but 
be well aware of the following issues, and these are partial lists of it, hallucinations. So let's say, you know, if it doesn't have the answer, it can come back to you with the wrong answers. And also, too, you can't just trust it right away. There are cases in which, you know, for example, like somebody who's demonstrating AWS bedrock um, doing um, some, uh, some of their co-pilot uh, kind of thing, and, it, and basically we ask it to generate test cases, and it comes back with the wrong thing, we, we realize. So those kind of stuff, you know, you can't, cannot trust the AI um, chat GPT to be right every single time. And of course, there are ethical concerns, potential misuse, you know, the respons responsible AI thing comes into play, all of these things. And then how about real-time, up-to-date data? So we can definitely like use rack pattern for to kind of uh, supplement what LLMs cannot do. And then of course, current LLM usages is not ready for production. We need to kind of build system that can truly scale and the security concerns too. So just be aware of all those issues uh, in addition to many other things. And so now with that, I think I'm like right on time. So these are the resources. Um, if you're interested, this slide deck can be accessed here. And then if you miss it, don't worry about it because you can connect with me and then I can send it to you as well. Um, yeah, okay. And then just a couple, it, once you have this slide deck, you can kind of look at, um, because I did a workshop on PG Vector too, so I thought these are kind of interesting from Superbase, which is they, they have a hosted uh, PG Vector for free that you can use too. Um, so it, I find PG Vector to be quite easy to kind of work with uh, right off the bat kind of thing. So. Um, okay, so PG Factor and then also Langchain 4J, if you're a Java person, there are a bunch of examples too, and I highlighted Spring Boot and RAG um, in there. Okay, and then also there's an open source ranking information on this uh, insight collection too. And then also I have my Twitch stream I mentioned to you earlier, so if you want to follow me, this, this is my handle there. I also actually multi-stream to uh, YouTube as well, so you can follow me there. And then also, this, this one thing is from my company too. If, if you are ever interested, your company or looking, you're looking for kind of some kind of product discovery, you know, goes beyond just the implementation. You want to kind of get some um, free help. And actually my company is also offering some product analysis. And if you want to, if you're a startup company, right, for example, we'll be happy to help you to, to kind of work with that. And with that, I want to thank you very much. Um, and thank you again uh, for you to spend the time with me for half an hour here or 35 minutes and also for the team here to help me. Thank you so much. And, uh, and please stay in touch. And this is how you can stay in touch with me, my C-Jobs and all that. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Yeah.